So they're bringing, they're bringing in a tradition of using stone, they're using stone to make sculpture and so on. And that's an Indianizing derivative. But it's all, it's basically all techniques which they use. There appears to be no borrowing at all in the water system. You never see anything like a barai in India, as far as I know. And, and you don't even see a pattern like the barai anywhere else in Southeast Asia, except where the Khmer Empire is located. So it's a dual answer. You have to have the Indianizing maths and trigonometry combined with the local knowledge, which allows us to take off like it does. And then that resource control allows the enormous expansion of the urban complex. It's been described as Chinese behavior for 500 years in a Southeast Asian society. It's just extraordinary. So, um, well, thank you. That's a great, that was a great talk. I love the, the light on it. Um, but um, to go uh, across the world for just a second, the, the Incas were organized with the labor tax in some ways look, look fairly similar. And it seems that they're also doing work, work we're trying not only time and labor, but actively pushing against the development of a market economy. So you sort of see market at the, at the extremes, but you don't see that in the center. Sure. And that's a fairly common thing, at least in some of these command eco economies, right. right, where you're trying to, to dissipate market forces. And so I've struck a, about halfway through, you had that uh, incredible slide that showed the market economy with rice having just a little tiny bit and then this huge amount of stuff being brought daily. So I guess my question is trying to get some sense then of the relationship of these, of, these, of these temple economies to the market and then perhaps the role of the market after a collapse and maybe some of those market forces and how they may have been involved in, in this transition. Um, it actually part, is part of a very complex question about the degree of integration in Greater Angkor. Were the outer portions tightly integrated with the center or were they just service deliverers? And it appears predominantly that they're service deliverers. That's not an economy. They are obligated to deliver that material. So there's no, there's no transaction involved as far as we can judge. Well, there's a spiritual trend. I mean, the, they and go there because they, they, make, cause they make the lotus blow. That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. The other part of it is that living in Angkor, and you can see this really clearly in Bali, if you live near a big temple in Bali, the amount of stuff that is left over after a big ceremony is just colossal. And that material just vanishes out into the population. So there's a, there's a return, but there isn't actually a market economy for the value of rice. That's just dominated by these rulings about what has to be delivered. But there is, there's a conundrum to this. There is Chinese pottery coming into Angkor trade ware from the 9th century. And by the time you get to the 12th century, almost anywhere you excavate in Angkor, roughly 6 to 8% of the assemblage will be Chinese trade ware, which suggests a very consistent market hierarchy delivering produce out into the urban system. So my guess would be that the overall way Angkor functions is monthly, weekly, and daily markets, and that the daily markets are at almost every intersection. So there's a bit of a conundrum here. There does appear to be a quite efficient mechanism for distributing a relatively rare resource, but we presume that that's just the signature for all sorts of other stuff being moved around. The big deal is that this is not a monetized economy. There's no money. There's money in other societies around. There's no trace of a currency. And when you look in the inscriptions, what you find repeatedly is differential values of products being referred to. But they change all the time. You know, textile in this inscription is worth one thing, and textile in this inscription is worth something else. Like it's an incessantly fluctuating relative value system. So it, it would be a very interesting cross case to the Khmer because it's clearly in many ways a command economy, but it's a command economy depending substantially 
on supplying vast amounts of material to the shrines. But then the implication being that some local domestic level, nobody at the top cares. That's not the control that the Inca said. They simply don't care. There is not a single water management title anywhere in the Anquirian administration. They're not interested. It appears to all be run at a grassroots level, which we still don't fully understand. But there does not appear to be anybody standing there saying, you will do this, you will do this. As they say, follow the money. Where did the gold come from? Is it locally mined or placer? In which case they would have instant economy right. if they needed one because it would have had international value. Right. It, it appears not. The, the gold appears to be going entirely into this elite value system and it appears substantially like the Roman amounts of gold to be derived from hitting other people on the head. This is a, this is a plunder capital. The, the Khmer are immensely aggressive. <laughs> Then every ruler is waging major wars out into Vietnam, out into the Chao Phraya Basin. And there are comparatively small gold mines in the area of Angkor itself. So this appears to be wealth accumulating from elsewhere. There's a really sad story of them taking one of the Cham capitals and they captured the history of the Cham rulers and it was written on gold plates and presumably chucked in the furnace, melted down, used for something else, just lost, gone forever. So that the suspicion is that this is like Rome capturing the treasury of Dacia and writing off the tax cost of Rome. It's, it's a plunder economy. A lot of people don't like to say that, but that's what I, that's what I mean. yes it is. But whether there is some system then, because there's that amount of wealth moving around, that there is a, a sub-economy that is operating differently, it would be really interesting to pursue. I can add to that, there's the famed uh, Chinese emissary to, to Cambodia, Jim Daguan, at the end of the 13th century, emissary of the Yuan Dynasty. And there were a lot of Chinese there that were as part of the market economy. Yeah. And his recommendation for other Chinese was to marry a Khmer woman because they controlled the market. That's right. That's maybe he explains the Chinese ceramics company. Yeah. And, and also, you don't have to wear any clothes, and <laughs> it's very easy to build a house. And the back explanation to this is that the preceding Chinese trade commissioner to Cambodia had vanished. And this is perhaps the explanation why <laughs> he didn't fancy going back to China. <laughs> the, the female economy um, is also a really interesting issue. I, I worked in Ghana for some years, and almost all of the lorry trade in Ghana was run by women. And they simply commissioned drivers and the trucks, and they were in contact with women all over Ghana, working out where crop differentials were the largest and then taking these trucks to those locations. And you would see these enormous vehicles pounding along the roads in Ghana with a driver and then some very determined woman sitting in the cab. So clearly there is a whole system of this, of this working and a very elaborate communication system. So there is, there is a market system of some sort, but whether that is only in the late 12th century, in the 13th century, which is when Chotaquan was there, is the big question. Whether it's there earlier and precedes Java in the 7th and the 12th century is, is not clear. I've never thought about that before. That would be worth following up as a comparison. Thank you. Maybe we should move on. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, our second speaker today is Dr. Sarah Clayson.
post postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia, and she recently obtained her uh, doctorate at Arizona State uh, University. Her innovative PhD research explored the urban morphology of Angkor in order to understand the low density uh, peripheries of local temple communities providing agricultural surface to the urban center. And you mapped over, I'm thinking from your website, 19,000 features, right, in the greater Angkor region from the 2012 uh, LIDAR mission, and you conducted a field survey of temple sites, which I think is very interesting. And you've also done interesting work at the uh, 10th century capital of Kulker, right? And so that's what I think we're going to hear about, but we're really thrilled to have you t here today and to follow up to Roland's talk, Dr. Fletcher, and, and your lecture is entitled Using Landscape Data to Map the Rise of Urbanism and Diachronic Changes in Water Management and Social Complexity in Cambodia. So welcome, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. So um, Roland actually introduced a lot of context to the talk that I'll be giving today. This is more based on my dissertation research. So I'll be diving a little bit deeper into some of the kind of the, the broader themes that Roland mentioned today. So this talk is comprised in three different parts. I'll first talk about two aspects of social complexity at Angkor. Roland mentioned many of these earlier, so this will I'll brush through these pretty quickly. But this includes the rise of urbanism and the height of complexity during the classic period, which we um, have already seen from Roland's talk. And then I show how I've used landscape data to understand the social complexity at Angkor. Um, so for this section, I'll give a brief introduction to some of the prior work that's been done on top-down and bottom-up processes, and then how we can identify that at Angkor. I'll then go through an analysis that I did as part of my dissertation, looking at the interaction of these top-down and bottom-up processes and how this changed over time. And then finally, at the very end, I'll show you some of the quick and preliminary results from the Cambodian Archaeological LIDAR initiative. Um, this was... Um, started by my colleague Damian Evans and then I'm now co-directing that with him. So I'll show you the work that we're doing as part of that. So the Greater Angkor region was home to several successive capitals of the Khmer Empire from the 9th to 15th century. Angkor rose out of politically independent principalities known as Funan and Chen La. Angkor is often divided into four different time periods, the pre-Angkorian, which is before 802 CE, the early Angkorian from 802 to 1000 CE, the Classic Age from 1000 to 1327 or thereabouts CE, and the post-classic. So the early Angkorian period was characterized by peaceful expansion and extensive building projects with an economic base of agriculture and trade. The Classic Age was marked by military conquests, power struggles, and more extensive trade networks, and the post-classic represents the decline of Angkor. So no large state temples were constructed during this time period, and as we just heard about, the hydraulic infrastructure began to fall into disrepair. So the height of social complexity was reached during the classic period, especially under the rule of Jayavarman VII, who um, Roland mentioned in his earlier talk. This is a picture of the Bayan. We we're discussing that at lunch. So these are the heads of Jayavarman overseeing um, his empire. So Angkor is a, low, a sprawling, low-density urban complex with hundreds of temples and occupation mounds connected through a network of hydraulic infrastructure. Until recently, the full extent of this network was um, not very well understood, and this is because much of the habitational space was constructed in non-durable organic materials that have since perished. Um, but as Roland um, showed us in depth, the recent LIDAR acquisition and the resulting mapping that we were able to do with that shows the development of very densely occupied urban spaces. So these um, kind of denser or more densely occupied spaces that we're calling epicenters, which isn't a perfect word, we're still working on the perfect word for it, are easily identifiable um, by their grids, where, ro where roads delineate city blocks, which consist of house mounds and house ponds. Um, and this is to be differentiated from the more rural areas that are comprised of temple communities, which are shown here in B. Um, these are lower density settlement units comprised of a small primary temple and associated reservoirs and house mounds. So the epicenters have often been referred to as cities, but Roland mentioned this in his talk as well. They're not really cities. They're rather civic ceremonial zones 
or royal ritual zones kind of within this larger complex. Um, so with the LIDAR, we can use this data to build chronological models of what urbanization looked like at Angkor over time. So here's the imagery from Pre Root. This is uh, the 10th and the 11th century landscapes are characterized by a central state temple. These temples were often moated, but the urban landscape within the moated areas was largely unstructured. And then stretching between these central temples was a low density urban landscape with small temple communities and associated rice fields. During this time, the first large hydraulic infrastructure um, was con constructed in the ruralist area. Here's the imagery from Angkor Wat, which you've seen. So the orthogonal, cardinally oriented city grids, which are very visible in this LIDAR data, were constructed in the 11th and 12th centuries, so the first part of the classic period. These are highly structured urban spaces and um, that are within and encroaching beyond the moated temple precincts. Um, this is characterized by Angkor Wat here, um, which was built in the mid-12th century. So like the central state temples from the 9th and 10th centuries, these temples were also linked by a low density network of smaller temple communities with rice fields. And these state temples are high density nodes in an increasingly complex and polynucleated urban space. By the late 12th and 13th centuries, the structured urban landscape was well established and ex extended far beyond these temple enclosures. The previous grids were restricted to temple precincts. However, the constructions of the walls of Angkor Thom kind of mark a shift from temple enclosures to city enclosure. So while there is an orthogonally cardinally oriented grid, um, inside of Angkor Thom, the city blocks are more heterogeneous and not as formalized as the ones at Angkor Wat. This, is, this variability is likely a function of increasing population and complexity during this time period. So Angkor reaches its extent during this time with the urban core expanding over 35 square kilometers and the low density networks of temples and rice field communities extending across over 1,000 square kilometers. So we often credit Angkor Thom to the King Jayavarman VII. Um, Jayavarman VII is considered to be the most powerful king in Khmer history. Uh, to give you a little context, this is about 30 years after the death of Suri Varman II, who built Angkor Wat. So Angkor is famous for Angkor Wat, but really we do the height um, a generation or two later with Jayavarman VII. Jayavarman VII conquered the Chans and expanded the reach of the empire from, La from Thailand into Laos and Burma. Along with this imperial ex expansion, Jayavarman VII <coughs> also embarked on monumental building projects. His constructions include 102 hospitals. So this, we were talking about this again at lunch, um, the first instant of national health care that he was providing to his citizens. Um, hundreds of kilometers of roadways with rest houses and laterite bridges along them. He also constructed three massive temples, Tapram, Prekan, and the Bayan which were constructed in honor of its mother and father, and then the Bayon, which is in the middle of Angkor Thom. The stone for these temples was quarried up to 35 kilometers away and transported to Angkor via a network of channels, with each block weighing up to 1.5 tons. Roland mentioned this as well, and I stole this slide from him, <laughs> but um, in addition to these temples being absolutely massive, there's also records suggesting that they were coated with gold. So this picture shows some of the walls in the interior that may have been used for that purpose. And it was, Angkor Wat was allegedly covered with gold on the outside as well, and this is a reconstruction of what that may have looked like. But I think that's understated. <laughs> there we go. Um, but the real cost of a temple, as Roland kind of alluded to earlier, is not its initial construction, it's the maintenance. Um, so Roland mentioned some inscriptions from Tap Prom, which indicate that almost 80,000 people were involved in supplying the temples with goods and services. So the majority of these, around 66,000 people, were included in this extended economic catchment, um, while over 12,000 people were within the enclosure and responsible for its daily ma maintenance and functioning. And as Roland mentioned, this included over 600 Apsara dancers. <coughs> 
Um, so at Angkor Wat, there are um, hundreds of Axra dancer bar reliefs. And it's possible that each one of these bar reliefs represents an individual dancer. So this one's particularly interesting because of what she's holding. It's a pad with inscriptions on it, um, which suggests that she could read. She would have been a higher class woman, but not top ranked. And because of the location of this bas relief within Angkor Wat, we know that she was not of the highest background dancer rank. So think about a medieval period society where middle class women um, were literate. So how is the social system structured to allow for this level of social complexity? And how is the population mobilized to produce enough food to support the large number of individuals moving into these urban areas and working for these temples? So as we begin to think about these questions, it's important to note that Angkor did not have a cash economy. Instead, the economy was underwritten by a surplus of rice agriculture and supplemented in later periods by imperial conquest and trade. So I wanted to look at the ownership and management of agricultural land and what insight that can provide regarding the social complexity that we see during this classical period at Angkor. So the integration of technical practices and social arrangements related to the allocation of irrigation water have been widely studied. Some, such as Wittfogel's theory of oriental despotism, have argued that correlation between the size of irrigation systems and central control is positive, so that the presence of large-scale irrigation suggests also the presence of rulers with strong centralized authority. Um, Wittfogel's theories have received significant criticism, and it's been shown that large hydraulic works do not necessarily need large centralized authority, um, so moving beyond things like Wittfogel, there are a number of ways to study this relationship between social complexity, water management, and urbanism. Most societies with water management systems have an institutional locus that acts authoritatively to regulate and ensure proper operation. These social and political organizations are often categorized as centralized or top-down or decentralized bottom-up. Centralized systems often tend to serve the aspirations of the state, whereas decentralized systems often tend to prioritize local communities. So as I mentioned before, archaeological and ethnographic studies show that many large irrigation systems are managed independently through self-organized cooperatives without centralized administration, um, like Lansing's work on the island of Bali, for example, although this work is not without its criticism either. But then also in Sri Lanka, which had a large decentralized feudal system of administrative, um, administration managing large water storage facilities and a very sophisticated hydraulic system. So you've seen this map before, but we can investigate this relationship between top-down and bottom-up water management strategies over time for rice irrigation at Angkor. Over the course of half a millennia, the fl a natural floodplain spanning more than a thousand square kilometers was transformed into an elaborately engineered landscape, characterized by top-down, state-sponsored hydraulic infrastructure. The construction dates for many of these large state-sponsored features based on inscription and previous work um, by my colleagues, including one sitting in the room, are re reconstructed here. So prior accounts of the agriculture at Angkor have focused on this infrastructure associated with top-down management, both because of theoretical preconceptions and the documentation of these absolutely massive reservoirs and channels like the West Barai, which Roland mentioned earlier, um, which are just kind of these spectacularly large water management features. However, in addition to these state-sponsored infrastructure, there are residential hamlets with primary temples and associated reservoirs, rice fields, and house mounds that are organized on a local level. So these low-density zones extend from the epicenters at Angkor, and at Angkor's height, there were over a thousand of these temple communities with over 3,000 associated reservoirs. So these are distinctly different from the large state uh, temples like the Bayan and Angkor Wat. Today, these temples consist of anything from a footing to a few bricks or stones, 
or a little more than the faint impression of a mound. So to give you a sense of scale, this is uh, average size temple and reservoir. The reservoir is one of over 3,000, and here's how it compares to the largest reservoir at Tikal. So even on a local level, these things are absolutely massive. Hall proposed that the economy and politics of Angkor were managed through a hierarchy of these temples. According to this, temples served as collection and redistribution centers where resources were collected and passed from smaller local temples to royal and elite temples in the epicenters. Remote sensing projects and archaeological investigations have identified spatial associations between these temples, hydraulic features, and rice fields that have substantiated this relationship between temples and rice production. For example, our colleague Scott Hawken mapped rice fields in the greater Angkor region and found very clear associations between temples and rice fields. Like these examples of radial rice fields, where the rice fields are literally radiating out from temples, and we were able to identify temples by looking at the middle of these radial systems. Uh, similarly, archaeological excavations have revealed architectural coherence between temples, water management features, and rice fields such as laterite or stone line channels leading from temple moats into adjacent rice fields. So these two systems represent state-sponsored top-down and localized bottom-up water management. Identifying these processes archaeologically is interesting in and of itself, uh, but we can take it a step further. Over 20 years of mapping and chronological models of development at Angkor have now emerged that allow us to te test this relationship between top-down and bottom-up water management strategies and how that changes over time. This leads to a set of expectations that can be tested statistically. For example, if the two strategies do not interact, we would expect temple communities to emerge randomly across the landscape without association with state-sponsored infrastructure. Hydraulic infrastructure and that is built around the same time or that's pre-existing. So the average nearest neighbor analysis ratio is defined as the observed average distance between points divided by the hypothetical distance between points. Values less than one indicate clustering, while values greater than one indicate dispersion. So if there is clustering, then we can take it a step further and see if this clustering is related to the location of state-sponsored hydraulic infrastructure or if it's independent from the state-sponsored infrastructure. So to do this, I first needed to date the temples, which was no small task. There are 139 temples with dates in Cambodia and over 1,400 temples without dates across Cambodia. So collecting data for all the non-dated temples using excavation and traditional dating methods would be extremely costly and time-consuming. Thanks to decades and centuries of surveys, I did, however, have a lot of attribute data for these temples, including things like their size, their building materials, artifact types, and morphologies. With this attribute data, I was able to use a combination of multiple linear regression and semi-supervised machine learning to predict dates for the non-dated temples. I then cross-validated the results of this work using a standard K-fold holdout procedure, which indicated that I was able to predict dates with an average absolute error of 49 to 66 years. So knowing what state infrastructure and what temples were built during each century, I then conducted the nearest neighbor analysis. When only new constructions for each period are considered, there is clustering with ratios around 0.65 for the 9th to 12th centuries and heightened clustering in the 13th century with a ratio of 0.31. And here you can see how the temples are built on the landscape over time and in construction in relation to the construction of state-sponsored hydraulic features and the epicenters. With the relatively denser areas depicted here in red with the point density analysis. So this clustering does tend to be happening in areas of newly um, constructed state-sponsored hydraulic infrastructure, 
construction, which is very visible uh, with the construction of the East Bry in the mid to 8th century. Could you go back to the moment? Yeah, from there. Yeah. Wow. These images aren't very good, but they get the point across. Um, so with this basic information that temple communities do tend to cluster around newly constructed and pre-existing pre hydraulic features, I was then interested to see which of these temples actually had access to the hydraulic infrastructure. So I calculated the percentage of temple communities that have access to this state-sponsored hydraulic infrastructure based on proximity and location down slope. So on the left, you can see a temple with access to the state-sponsored hydraulic infrastructure. It's adjacent to a state-sponsored channel. Um, and this is compared to the temple on, I guess, sorry, on your right, on the, and then compared to the temple on the left um, that's um, upstream of all infrastructure and does not have any access to the state-sponsored infrastructure. So the results indicate that over 70% of temples constructed before 850 CE had access to the hydraulic infrastructure, and this declined in the 10th century. The percentage of total temples on the landscape with access to the hydraulic infrastructure rises above 60% again around 1000 CE, and remains fairly consistent throughout the rest of the study period. However, if you look only at the temples that are constructed during the 13th century, which are shown here in blue at the end, you'll see that almost 100% of the temples constructed during this time period have access to the hydraulic infrastructure. And this is also the period with the highest amount of clustering on the landscape. So I wanted to look closer at this um, increase in preferential construction location. So here are the point densities on the landscape again for each time period, but this time I'm using the same scale. So as you can see, there's a sharp increase in the density on the landscape from the 9th to 11th centuries. And then after the 11th century, the density does not increase significantly. If we look closer at the landscape, um, this is some of the mapping work done by my colleague Scott Hawkins, who mapped all of the rice fields. You can see that there's an extremely complex palimpsest of temples and agricultural fields. And now we have the dates for these temples, so we can begin to pull apart the landscape to see what it looked like during different time periods. We also have another line of evidence coming from the inscriptions. An analysis of inscriptions, Lustig and Lustig, have found evidence suggesting increasing competition for land over time at Angkor. So here's a Bayesian curve probability plot of the number of temple constructions on the landscape over time based on the landscape data. So as you can see, there's a drop off in the new temple foundations around the 11th century CE which is the same time that the density on the landscape begins to taper off. So if we factor in insights from Lustig and Lustig's study of inscriptions, we can start to get a better idea of what's happening. In the 9th and 10th centuries, there are many references in inscriptions to lower class communities and individuals buying and selling land. This fits well with the landscape data that indicates the construction of many new temple communities during this time period. In the 11th century, there are land sales records of lower class individuals selling land to higher class individuals. This suggests a transfer of land ownership from autonomous village communities to elites beginning around the 10th century and continuing through the 11th century. At the same time that the landscape shows the end of the growth phase, followed by a drastic decline in the number of new temple foundations on the landscape. By the mid-11th century, the lower class owners disappear from inscriptions altogether. So this title that once referred to lower class landowners no longer exists. And this is presumably because um, upper elites in the state have bought all of their land. 
By the beginning of the 12th century, higher class landowners become temple staff in state temples. And by the end of the 12th century, there are no more records of land sales in the inscriptions. And this is at the same time that we see a massive decrease in the number of new temple foundations on the landscape. So now let's relate this back to what's going on with complexity over time at Angkor. The pre-Angkorian period is characterized by the beginning of temple foundations on the landscape. This is also when the first large-scale state-sponsored hydraulic features are built, and about 60 to 75 percent of temples constructed during this time period have access to that infrastructure. During the early Angkorian period, bottom-up temple units explode onto the landscape, developing virgin land for agriculture and expanding the footprint of Greater Angkor. About 60% of the temples that are built during this time period have access to the state-sponsored hydraulic infrastructure. We also begin to see the first state, central state temples with largely unstructured urban spaces emerging around this time. By the Classic period, we start to see a decrease in the foundation of new temple communities on the landscape and an increase in social complexity within the urban spaces. Angkor Wat is built around 1140, and Jayavarman VII constructs his three major temples at the end of the 12th century and leading into the 13th century. These temples that are built during this time period are owned by the state or upper elites who are buying up massive tracts of preferential land um, during this time period, and in doing so, exerting more control over the agricultural system, presumably in order to increase surplus for the non-producers living in these recently founded state temples and the highly structured urban occupation spaces. And by the post Angkorian period, there are few temple constructions, but they all have access to the hydraulic infrastructure. So the system at Angkor was a hybrid one, combining elements of a top-down and bottom-up water and land management. These result results are counter to the typical dichotomy that's presented um, between the two types of water management strategies and may have been a highly resilient strategy that allowed the city of Angkor to expand and thrive um, through the early Angkorian phase. The increase uh, competition for land and increased demand for surplus during the classic period coincides with the gradual accumulation of land by elites as part of a state-sanctioned effort to extract more resources from the peripheries. This centralization of land ownership would have undermined the autonomy and decentralization of community-organized agricultural production as fewer local communities, temple communities, were founded, and those that did exist sold their land to upper uh, and state temples. So this change in the ownership and administration of agricultural land has significant implications for our understanding of the Khmer Empire and it's also mirroring changes that are happening co-currently with urbanism and social complexity within the empire. So now I'll switch gears a little bit. Um, and now that we've looked at the Greater Angkor region, I'll show you some of the work and research questions that we're now addressing as part of the Cambodian Archaeological LIDAR initiative. So imagery from two large-scale light detection and ranging acquisitions have been used to identify seven previously concealed and undocumented dense urban landscapes in Cambodia. We've already looked at Angkor in depth today, and now I'll quickly show you some of the preliminary results from three other uh, sites on the landscape that um, highlight some of the methodological issues and conceptual issues that we're facing. So location for these surveys were chosen based on the existence of large temples, which um, for some of them were once thought to be little more than pilgrimage sites. So I'll start by showing you the results from Phnom Kulen, which other than Angkor and Koh Kher, was the third area surveyed in 2012, and then again at a greater extent by Cali in 2015. So here's the region of Phnom Kulen. 
Archaeological research in this area has been limited by the legacy of conflict on the landscape. This area was the last stronghold of the Khmer Rouge and was heavily mined. So while many of the areas of Cambodia have since been demined, this area still remains very dangerous. Several of the locals that we work with have lost limbs long after the fall of the regime as a result of the landmines that have remained on the landscape. I've done some work in these regions with colleagues and we've had to be very careful not to um, venture off of clearly marked paths um, and to stay with our guides at all times, which of course makes systematic survey of the landscape very difficult. Um, further complicated by dense vegetation in this region, here's the satellite imagery of Phnom Kulen. Um, it's very difficult to see any archaeological features on the landscape. And here is the LIDAR data. So you can see a lot of large linear features cross-cutting the landscape. And here's a little, it's a little bit more clear with the mapping work, and this was done by our colleagues who have been working in this region for decades. So these large cross causeways cross-cutting the city and many of the other urban features had not been recorded between the acquisition of this LIDAR data. The next slide I'll show you is Sambor Prey Cook. I just returned from Cambodia on Wednesday, as a matter of fact, and I was working on mapping and ground verifying this site. Sambor Prey Cook is a pre Quarian site in the Kempon Tom region of Cambodia. Um, it dates to the Chenla period, which is from the 6th to 9th century CE. And so this becomes really interesting because it's kind of a precursor to the urbanism that we see at Angkor. So again, very dense um, vegetation. Here's satellite imagery from the region. It's very difficult to see many of the archaeological features. And the LIDAR data. And here's some of the preliminary mapping work um, that we're working on right now. So this is a precursor to the first site um, prey route that I showed you at Angkor. Um, and you can see how it's a little less structured, and the dense occupation to the left is actually independent of the temple complexes that are here to the right. So this seems to be an earlier form of urbanism that we're seeing in the region. Just a quick question. Is there any dating for that outer stuff? Very little. No. Yeah. Because it, be it could be much later. Right. Yeah. And the last one that I'll show you is Precon of Kampon Spy. This site is really interesting because it's been thoroughly surveyed and mapped before the acquisition of the LIDAR data. And this was done by some of our very close colleagues um, that aren't in the room with us today, but we, are, we respect their work immensely, which is important um, before I show you the next couple of slides. So Brekan of Kampan Spa is about 100 kilometers east of Angkor. Um, we know relatively little about this site, although our colleagues are working there now. It was probably founded around the 11th century CE. So here is uh, satellite imagery of the site. You can see the outlines and walls of the larger temple complex. This is actually the largest temple complex in the Angkor Angkorian era, and the walls are enclosing about five square kilometers. And here's what the mapping work looked like after about a decade of work on the field, including ground surveys. Just to follow up, the middle piece is earlier, and the outer piece is generally considered to be J7, I think. Of this side? Yeah, but the middle one is earlier. Um, so here's the LIDAR data. Well, do you know what um, period the earlier? And that's, I think, um, 11. Um, so here's the LIDAR data, and then if we look closer at that central core, which Roland, which I did earlier, um, you can see that there's a highly, highly structured urban area. Um, and then switching back to the mapping work of our, of our colleagues, um, in this case the LIDAR data is revealing a level of detail of the urban grid that was not visible on the ground. Um, especially to archaeologists conducting very thorough um, ground truthing surveys of this. Um, one of our colleagues, Damian Evans, 
um, before they published this, he went out with um, the team that had been working there and was like, no, nope, there's, there's nothing here. And then a few months later, the LiDAR data came in, and it's, it's pretty astounding what it's revealing. And it's nice that it happened to David because it cools everybody else. Exactly. It takes the pressure off of the, <laughs> the, the rest of the teams that are working there. So this actually raises the question of the nature of ground verification that's needed and how this differs based on um, site types and local geography. So last summer I was at a workshop at the Santa Fe Institute with a lot of our Maya colleagues were working with LIDAR data and it became very clear that the challenges of ground verification that are faced by our Maya colleagues are very different um, than the challenges that we're facing thus far in Cambodia. So for example, the house mounds and platforms that they're identifying using LIDAR data in the Maya region are much more difficult to see in the LIDAR data than these city grids that we're seeing here in Cambodia and the Khmer world. So Damien and I um, organized the Paris Dialogue on Archaeological LIDAR last December, and at the, this um, dialogue we discussed, among other things, industry standards for ground verification, recognizing that different types of sites and regions may have had different standards. And this is important because we've kind of been publishing past each other, fighting about how much ground truthing is necessary. Um, so that was kind of a big um, step forward for our community. So as part of a multidisciplinary team, we're now working to map and establish the chronologies for these epicenters across Cambodia. I'm primarily interested in moving forward and understanding the urban morphologies and water management of these epicenters, especially how that relates back to Angkor. But you can see that there's a range of diverse and fundamental research questions that have arisen as a result of this work um, in the region. So an acknowledgement of the funding sources and then my colleagues. Could you whip back to your diagram of the phases of the occurrence of uh, structures? That's it. This is, um, it's really nice to see so, um, the, the work that uh, Eileen's been doing on land sales. Because the other thing that is happening when you get to Javan the seventh in the late twelfth century is he's requiring everybody who wants to make religious donations to make them only to designated stone temples, mm. and they designated twenty thousand shrines or gods in the whole of the state. So they're in effect centralising the entire donation system. Mm which I'm sure has some interesting payoffs in it. Uh, but what is also really striking is that when you get to 1250, you have the iconoclasm, which is now securely dated by Christoph's work. The, for those who don't know, the iconoclasm is a period when all these Java and the Seventh Temples are basically desecrated. Every Buddha, is chiseled out of the walls. So if you just take the big enclosure temples, that's 40,000 Buddhas chiseled just out of the tops of the walls. What really struck Christoph and I, however, was that once you add in this information about gold on the shrines inside those big temples, which would all have had Buddha symbols on them, Guess what I, as a cynic, think that 1250 iconoclasm is actually about? It's about getting that gold. And the cutting out of the Buddhas is the equivalent in the Reformation of smashing stained glass windows. It's basically theatre. The big deal is getting their wealth. An excuse to strip the temples yeah. of the gold. So the question then is, this is a really interesting process because these temples have basically taken over the ownership of land. But this process of stripping the temples is done by the state. It's not a, this isn't a revolution. This is a state operation 
which is essentially doing to these big Buddhist establishments what the Chinese emperors did periodically to the big Buddhist establishments in China. They just took them over and removed their wealth. Now, the interesting question there is, if you do that, if you disestablish these big shrines, what's happening to the land? Um, well, we've, we've talked about the implications of the iconoclasts. So, if I, d I don't know if the um, political and religious importance of the temple is also being stripped, or if the wealth is being stripped. Um, the two would go together. And Jyotar Kwan has an interesting remark where he refers to several types of shrines and he talks about the pagodas with bronze Buddhas, which mm -hmm. is obviously these big ones. And he says there is no music and no activity in these shrines, mm -hmm. as if they have almost been shut down. Because clearly, having removed their wealth, they've disestablished a great portion of the establishment. That leads to a really interesting implication about that. Well, absolutely. I mean, I, if you, at any stage of the game, remove kind of the top of the hierarchy from the political and social system, and we agree that the economy of Angkor is structured through this web and hierarchy of temples, and then the top temples are removed from the system, that introduces chaos in many, many different realms. Because there are two options. One would be is to say, as with Henry VIII, it's the state that resumes that wealth which is straightforward, it would just say we own all the land. But what Henry VIII did with all that wealth was to redistribute it to the, to the middle class, the middle class could buy it. Mm -hmm. But who would do that in the Korean system? Well, it also seems as though the system is over-centralized and over-extended mm -hmm. and beginning to feel the effects of the research that you were showing us earlier with the, the right. failing water management system, yeah. so it seems a bit of a, a triage move in desperate times, potentially. They've, they've certainly just had a very bad period. The, the disaster is actually in the following century, but mm -hmm. they've had a very bad dry period in the first half of the 13th. There's a really, there's a really interesting problem there. I have never thought in terms of that resumption of, mm -hmm. of land. That's really quite extraordinary. That's, it's very nice to put that together. Question. Um, when you estimated the dates uh, for these undated sites, what seemed to be the most sort of um, important aspects of the architecture or of the sort of building that? So nothing independently was. Um, so multiple linear regression worked, but only worked if I had complete data sets. Um, so for some of the temples, because I combined 20 different surveys that have been done over the last century, um, some recorded building materials, some recorded artifact types, some didn't. Um, so that re resulted in kind of an incomplete data set. So for multiple linear regression, I could use a combination of factors and produce dates for, predict dates for about half of the temples but the other half couldn't even be included in the analysis. Um, but in that sense, I mean, in general, bricks are earlier, sandstone is a little bit later, but it's really the combination of all of the different attributes. That's really cool. So, yeah, I mean, that was, that was really cool. <laughs> um, but I, I had a, I, I guess, um, go back to, to maybe some more, I guess, fundamental issues. If you go back look at, for example, at Mesopotamia, um, you sort of emerge first with these sort of temple economies, then the palaces emerge. Uh, they're, then they're in parallel, and then there's tension between those uh, economies. And you see that, I and mean, you talked about medieval, but there's also tensions. The, the monks are getting lots of money. You know, the, you know there's, there's lots of movement there. So, so I guess my, my question from all that is that you talk about the state. You talk about the state fairly early, but I'm just very confused about, well, what is the state? Does that sort of idea change over time. Because also, going back to one of those images that you were showing earlier about how uh, I, you're showing like a, a canal and how it's being built and how they're being built in sections by people. So also some of the question was, 
Do they think they're working for the state? Are they working for the temple? Do they think they're working for themselves and the state takes over? So just curious, because it seemed like you had you were rushing the state very early on, but there were very different dynamics going yeah, on through that, time. Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, there are kind of two components of it. So we do have elite and state. And we have elite temples, and we have temples sponsored directly by the king. The elites tend to be related to the royalty in some way. But this becomes um, even more complicated when we factor in the other urban areas in Cambodia. And at this point, we have no idea what that political structure looked like or what those relationships looked like. Are these satellite cities? Are these um, competing city-states? Are they independent? How connected are they to Angkor? So the question that you're asking within the Angkor region, where it seems as though kind of by the end everything's subsumed into this one um, system under the, the state, might have been a little bit more independent um, earlier on. Um, but we're actually kind of seeing that to a certain extent mirrored on a regional scale. And these are very fundamental questions that we are not close to having the answers to. So it's an interesting thing to think about. Is there any evidence for monumental domestic architecture? So um, the domestic uh, architecture tends to be wooden houses built on wooden stilts, which don't leave a very good archaeological trace. And actually our colleagues, um, Miriam Stark and Allison Carter, have been working on domestic architecture. And they're having great difficulty to find you know, enough post holes to understand what a house actually looked so like. So like the king presumably lived in a little thatched hut near the... So, oh, so we do know of the palace. Okay, there's, there's a palace. Um, there's a palace at Angkor, there's a palace at Kaker, which other than Angkor was the only other cap city to become capital or center, whatever word you want to use, the center of the Khmer Empire. So we have a palace there and we have a palace at Angkor. We have one in the um, to Okay. Yeah, that's right. And the, these were pretty fabulous, Judge Aquarius' description of what he was allowed to see in the palace in Angkor is just spectacular. And when do the palaces show up in this timeline? Are they scattered throughout? Are they? The first one would be about nine, nine, eight ninety. Is that it here? Yeah, that's all right. Eight, eight fifty to eight ninety. And they're always inside the temples. No, they're separate. They're separate. They're separate enclosure. What's unusual is that in the middle of Angkor, Angkor Tom, with the Bayon in its geometric center, was plonked around the palace, which had been there as an entirely separate entity prior to that. Yeah. 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 Too. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I, I, you know, sort of piggybacking on, on Justin's query as well, is one thing that I'm interested in is the way you can perhaps use the inscriptions too, because one ambiguity, of course, is that Lucifer really was supposed to be the centralized state, right? and it was owned by the king. And you see a lot in the inscription of the Sadaq and the Shiva Soma, that this was a land grant from the king. Right. And part, of course, of this was, was, was merit. Now, talk about karma ecologies in the sense that part of this incentive too, I mean, Justin's question was for the state, for the elite temples, and not to sound cynical, but there might have been an incentive that to build a temple was good for your chances of reincarnation possibly in your afterlife. But I'm also just wondering, can you make a distinction? How much autonomy did these temples have that were say, given by the, by the king himself or by, by the centralized state? which then became kind of a tax-free, you know, we can make comparisons with medieval Europe too, right? These yeah. Get taxes in a sense, right? But it would be for the merit of the king sometimes too, right? Right. So it, so it becomes what, it is really interesting because there are definitely, um, even within kind of the lower levels, there are different levels. So there are communities or groups of families um, that will there'll be a reference to a group of lower class families selling land for an elephant to a higher class individual. I don't know what three group, three families did with one elephant, but perhaps that was a placeholder for something else. But in some senses, the type of land expansion that we're seeing here at Angkor is very much influenced, has an Indian influence to it. So there are some texts coming from India around this time, which 
describe almost exactly what we're seeing here, where individuals are founding these kind of temple communities, um, clearing the land and creating new agricultural areas. And we have Indian texts describing this process, and it's almost happening on the landscape to a clearer, in a more direct way than is happening in India. So you kind of see how this is happening on the landscape in India, but it's almost as though it's like happening word for word in the, on the landscape in Cambodia. So that's really, so it's, it's definitely tied in with religious merit and all of the land sales records acknowledge that this is a gift of the king. So I am buying the land for X amount of rice or elephants or whatever it is, but it's only with the blessing of the king that I am able to do that. I think that's the other critical thing to follow up for people who are not familiar with the system. There is no autonomous aristocracy in the system. Everything, everything is owned by the ruler. You can have very powerful families, but they're not like the Norfolk's in